Final concluding session in the IFIP WG 8.6 Conference on Technology Transfer. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome to give uh, the final address um, Nandan Milikani, who is running the Unique, Identi Unique Identification Authority, Unique Identification Project, which is a project that we have discussed, as you can imagine, on, on a number of occasions over the last two and a half days. So we're all I'm uh, fascinated to hear what you have to say in your talk about. So, on behalf of the conference team on the work, and the working group, and indeed everybody in the audience, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us today. and it's really great to be here in the concluding session of this conference about success and failure, but both success and challenges or so whatever it's called now. Uh, I, I'll, very, I'll, I'll spend about 35 to 40 minutes just articulating the strategy and execution behind what we are doing in the UID or the Aadha project. Aadha means foundation. And then, you know, we can have questions after that. Uh, this project uh, you know, has been in the making for several years, but it finally took shape in the year 2009 when the government decided to set up this body called the Unique Identification Authority of India with the mandate to give a unique ID number to 1.2 billion people. So all residents of India would be eligible for this number. This happened sometime in January of 2009 and I joined this outfit on, in July 2009, exactly four years back. And uh, so when we Took it up, obviously, to the you know, fairly big challenge. You know, how do you give a unique number to a billion people and all that? And we, I think before we go into the solution, we need to know why we're doing this. Why would you do something crazy as this? And the reason is, is actually quite simple that unlike in the West, where people have many forms of identity, they have a birth certificate. In, in Western countries, 98% of births are registered at birth. They have passport, a driver's license, a EU card, whatever. Lots and lots of IDs. In India, uh, there are a lot of people who don't have any ID whatsoever. And the, the this, this challenge is because right at the root, at the time of birth, registrations are not that effective. And there are many states in India where more than half the births are not registered. So as a result, you have millions of people out there who don't have an acknowledgement of their existence by the state. People do have things like ration cards, but that's a state level document. It's a family document, so it's got a bunch of names on one ration card. People have voter ID cards, but that's not portable and that's over the age of 18. So there are some IDs, but it doesn't really solve their fundamental ID challenge. Now, historically, this may not have been a big deal, but with increasing mobility of people with their aspirations, people moving from villages to cities, from central India to coastal India, from north to south. Lack of identity is actually becoming a huge bottleneck for the future because without ID, they can't really do anything. They can't get a job, they can't get admission, they can't, uh, you know, they can't uh, get their entitlements, they can't open a bank account. So fundamentally, ID creates a divide between the sort of uh, people with ID and the people without ID. And as I said, the people without ID runs into hundreds of millions of people. It's not a small number. So the challenge was how do we bring all these, all the people who are left out from an ID perspective into the formal system, into a formal society and give them an ID to start and then they can get on with you know, other things in their lives. And that is really the purpose of this is it's really think of it as the world's largest social inclusion program where millions of people are being given an ID for the first time 
in their life, which is recognized by the state, and that, that's the important thing. Now, one way to think about it is, think of it as a 21st century Ellis Island. If, if you know the history of America, there were massive waves of migration to the US in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So 19th century uh, US, United States was migrants from you know, Ireland and Italy and Eastern Europe and all that. And they would all land up in a place called Ellis Island, which was where the Statue of Liberty is. And they would come and they would give a long, complicated Polish name. And the, and the guy sitting there says, no, that's not good enough. From now on, you'll be Sam Johnson or whatever, Sam David. And from that day onwards, in the new system, in the new world, he was Sam David. So it didn't really matter what his name was before. And if, you, if it so happened that one arm of your family came to Ellis Island and the other arm went to Nova Scotia, which was the landing point for Canadians, they had a different name because the name given at that point of entry was different. So basically, what is a name? A name is just a way of identifying a person. And therefore, you can think of this as a virtual Ellis Island where people who are outside the system are entering the system for the first time and getting an identity. And therefore, whatever name they register in the system on the day of their registration is their name now in the formal system for the rest of their lives. So think of it in that sense. Similarly, what is the date of birth? A date of birth is a date of birth. So many of these people don't have a date of birth and therefore we need to give them an approximate date of birth because we don't really know what the date of birth is. So the, what we have in our system is a name, a date of birth, the sex of the person and an address. So it's a very simple ID system. But the real challenge we had was how do we make sure if a billion people are going to enter the system and these billion people don't have any a priori data about their ID how do we make sure that everybody just gets one ID? Because unless we establish a unique ID for everyone, then this ID system is not really you know, going to fly because if somebody can get 100 IDs or 1,000 IDs, then you, know, you, you lose the whole purpose of having an ID system. So the challenge for us was how do we make sure that everybody gets only one ID? And it could not just be reliant on them saying, that they have not enrolled before because if somebody wants to game the system, they could go and enroll multiple times and just and they could enroll under different names and we would know. So the basic problem is when you don't have something, how do you make sure that you establish unique name? If you're if you're in Sweden or something and you know there are six million, eight million people and they all have birth certificates, you can use that birth certificate as the basic root ID with which you can give them an ID, but you can't do that here. So we came to the conclusion that the only way that we could do it on a scalable, sustainable and accurate basis was to do biometric deduplication. We said that if, if a person has, so we said what is the basic set of biometric details for a person which is sufficient to establish uniqueness across a billion people. Now this has not been done before so we'll find out whether it works or not. But we took the, we came to the conclusion after a lot of analysis that if we really looked at the digital patterns of the iris, both the iris as well as the digital patterns of 10 fingers, the sufficient digital diversity in that pattern to make that a unique digital signature for a billion people. And therefore, when we designed the system, we said apart from taking the name, address, date of birth and sex, we'll also take all the 10 fingerprints, we'll take the iris of both the eyes and we'll have a photograph. So that's really the broad contour of the data we collect. We also People do give their email IDs and phone numbers so that we can communicate with them, but that's all optional. So the basic sort of mandatory information is name, address, date of birth, sex, and biometrics, which is 10 fingerprints, photograph, and the iris of both eyes. Now, therefore, what we do with this data then is we do a process, which is really the technological heart of the system. I know the promoter talked about it yesterday. It's called biometric deduplication. So what happens in biometric deduplication is when somebody enrolls into the system, their biometrics are compared against the entire gallery or entire array of people that we have to see whether the biometrics are repeating in the system. And if they're repeating, we know that is a duplicate, it's somebody trying to enter again and therefore we reject that. So, the, it's, so you enroll into the system, you give all this information, your demographics and your biometrics, we run this process called biometric deduplication. If the person is a new person, we give him a number, if the person already has a number, we reject that num uh, reject that person. That's how it, how it works. So while it's it's simple uh, conceptually, it's obviously very complex, uh, very sophisticated to implement because it's all about the scale. So let's say today we have say 300 million people in a system, and let's say a million people 
enrolled that day into the system, then each of those million who have enrolled has to be compared against all 300 million on all biometric features. So that leads to several trillion comparisons every day. So for this, we have a massive infrastructure with several thousand servers. The entire thing is built using internet technology. Again, Pramod must have spoken about it. It's using all the open source stuff like Hadoop and other open source things that are used to power the internet companies. So we have taken that technology and applied it to a very different problem. And we put three different biometric sort of deduplication engines in, in sort of series. So we can sort of divide up the load. We can send the information. So if you get million packets, we can send 300 to one, 400 to the other, 300 to the third. And we can dynamically allocate those packets so that we get better efficiencies across machines. And all packets that are doubtful, we send to all three so that we eliminate error. So using this or one, this internet kind of technology for you know, all, all messaging infrastructure and then combined with having these multiple biometric engines, we have built an infrastructure which can process 1 million enrollment deduplications per day. And uh, currently, we have enrolled about 430, 440 million people, which is about a third of the country. And our enrollment rate is about 800,000 to a million a day. So in other words, those million land up and they're compared against our database and then the numbers are generated. So this is how we ensure deduplication. So one reason for collecting the biometrics is to ensure deduplication. And we believe, we, we, we also do demographic deduplication. For example, if by mistake somebody enrolls twice and use the same address, we can catch all that. So we have built an entire sort of deduplication capability that combines demographics and biometrics and lots of stuff. And now we, we feel comfortable that we, we will do biometric deduplication at 99.99% accuracy, which means we'll have 0.01% error, which means 100,000 and a billion. And therefore, we'll have to use other techniques of scrubbing the data to establish that even those duplicates are, cost, uh, are caught. So fundamentally, I think now we have a solution that allows us to make sure everybody gets a unique number. Now, the number itself is nothing but a 12-digit number with a, check, with a checksum in it. If we can go up to 100 billion numbers, so that is enough, you know, we don't have to reuse numbers. But what's important is that this has been designed as a digital ID. Because we said if we're going to design a system in 2011, there's no point giving a piece of paper. It's really important to give people a digital ID. So this number is not only a physical ID, everybody gets a letter. The real strategic value of this number, it's a digital ID. It's, it's a number on the cloud. And therefore, since it's a number on the cloud that's associated uniquely with the person, we also provide various ways of verifying at a point of transaction that this person is indeed the person he claims to be. And this act of verifying that the person is indeed the person he claims to be is called authentication. So we can authenticate a digital ID of a person at a point of contact, at a point of service. Now this authentication can be done in several ways. We can authenticate using the fingerprint. We can authenticate using the iris. We can authenticate using a one-time password which you send to your mobile phone or we can authenticate using a demographic detail like your name or date of birth. So there are multiple ways of authenticating that we provide. The authentication only answers the question, are you the person you claim to be? So it doesn't really share data about you with anybody. You, you basically come in there, say, I am, my name is X, my number is 123, and you supply an authentication attribute, whether it's biometric, de uh, demographic, or OTP. <coughs> And the system pings our database and says, okay, the person standing there in front of this service agent is indeed X by verifying that biometric or whatever attribute. So it's a yes, no system. It just, it doesn't, you can't say give me his address or give me his anything. It just does a yes, no. And therefore, it's a very simple system that on one side provides enrollment at scale where we can enroll a billion, uh, a billion people at the rate of one million a day. And on the other side, it provides online authentication of identity using variety of biometric, demographic, and you know, OTP kind of attributes. Now, these authentication capabilities of biometric and OTP and all that are made available as open APIs. So we believe that ID verification is fundamental to a whole host of service delivery and other kind of apps, and therefore, we wanted to build an open platform which allows different 
partners of ours, be it in the public or the private sector, to use ID verification in their apps. So therefore, all these are available as APIs. So you have authentication APIs. Those APIs can be called on a mobile phone, a smartphone, a tablet, a PC, or whatever device you have. It's completely open. And we have interfaces for various kinds of devices. So somebody building an app can therefore, you know, whatever be the logic of his application, at the point that he needs to verify the ID of a person, he makes a call to our system. The person gives his attributes, we give the answer, and the, the program continues. So this ability to create uh, apps by using ID is a very important part of, of the design of the system, which is why it's not about a card. It's not about a physical token that you get, because we think that physical tokens are limiting by nature, because you can't do, you can only do so much of the token, but it's actually the strategic value of this, it's an ID number on the cloud, which allows you to verify or authenticate wherever you are on the cloud using a variety of devices at the access point. And an open architecture of APIs which allows different people to build applications around this ID system, which could be for a variety of purposes. So that's the, the, you know, the whole thing here. Now the reason we did this was that we felt that identity is a horizontal service. You know, identity is a service which is required in banking, in public distribution systems, in healthcare, in, in so many, so many areas. And therefore, historically, when governments have worked on ID system, they work on it, which is commingled with a specific purpose. So somebody does an ID system to improve the voter ID system. Somebody else does an ID system for security. A third organization does an ID system for public service delivery. But we have done it as an ID system, as a platform, as a layer, as a horizontal thing which, which cuts across uh, all applications. So that's, in some sense, a very different way of looking at ID. So when we designed this system, we also had the challenge of how do we get to a billion people quickly? Because obviously, we couldn't build a system that would take decades and all that. We had to do it in a matter of years. So we had to have a highly scalable, open, interoperable architecture. And then we realized that it's not really about creating this huge organization that does IDs. So we said, and you know, what we've seen in the technology world, we said we need to create a distributed ecosystem of partners who will get our enrollment done with us. So the way it works is that the UID itself essentially runs the architecture, the technology, the standards, and the backend. And everything else is done through our partners. And we have many types of partners. The immediate set of partners we have are called registrars. Registrars are banks, state governments, or, you know, or companies who have an interest in uh, sprucing, cleaning up their ID uh, part of the database. So these are large organizations, state governments, so on. And we have an ecosystem of enrolling agencies, which are certified and empaneled bodies who are authorized to do enrollment on our behalf. And these, these enrollment agencies can be public, private companies who invest in the enrollment station, which is a PC with a bunch of devices. So they buy this stuff, and they get business from these registrars to do enrollment on their behalf. So you can think of UID as the core of the system which drives the technology platform. There's maybe 50 registrars who are our partners. They in turn hire 100 enrollment agencies. And the enrollment agency on behalf of the registrars open enrollment stations around the country. So it's a highly scalable linear model. You can open any number of enrollment stations. So currently we have about 25 to 30,000 enrollment stations that are live across the country. We just launched a few hundred in Bangalore uh, two days back. And every one of the enrollment stations has this equipment. It belongs to an enrollment agency. The enrollment agency has a business signed up with the registrar, like the state government or a bank and then they start doing the enrollment. And typically they do between 30 and 50 enrollments per station. The operator who operates that enrollment agency is a certified operator. So we have a whole system of testing and certifying operators. And only an empaneled operator can operate it for quality reasons. So what the net, set, net sort of implication of this is that we have a large ecosystem without really having employees in our own organization. So the whole UID system has about 280 employees. But the ecosystem has 100,000 people who do all these various functions. So the enrollment system has itself maybe 50,000 operators or more who have been trained. 
and the data comes to us and then as I said either the person gets a number or it's rejected. If the person is rejected he gets a reject letter. If the person gets a number he gets a letter in the mail. We also have an electronic Aadhaar program because sometimes the letter delivery takes time. People can go online and, and download their Aadhaar number. And so this whole system is a 100,000 person ecosystem uh, but run by a very small team of people who sort of manage this whole thing and define the standards and the contracts and the interfaces and the liabilities and all that stuff. So uh, we rolled it out in September 2010. We have enrolled, as I said, 430 million people. We have issued other numbers to 366 million people. Our goal is to have 600 million people or one out of every two Indian residents in the system by 2014. Now it's important to note that this is a number for residents. Possession of this number is not proof of citizenship. It's just an ID system which says that X is X and that X and that verification of X being X can be done at every every particular point. So it's not a citizenship number, it's not a you know proof of citizenship, it's just an ID number which all residents of India are eligible to get. So it's, it's a very simple ID system. But it's a digital ID system, it's an online ID system, it's an online ID verification system, and it is an open online ID verification system. Now, what are the possible applications of this? Now, there are many classes of applications that will emerge for this platform, and some of them are getting done, some of them will happen in the next five to 10 years. And we expect a lot of innovation to happen around this platform because we don't know what applications are going to be conceptualized by various people. And therefore, we expect a thriving ecosystem to, uh, to emerge around this platform. And I think my friend uh, and chief architect Pramod talked about it, but I'll just give you a comparison with GPS. Now, if you know the history of GPS, so of global positioning systems, the GPS was actually designed as part of the Cold War or Star Wars between the United States and the Soviet Union. And the purpose of GPS when it was conceptualized, you know, in the time of Reagan and all that, was really for accurate missile targeting. So it, essentially the GPS was giving the exact latitude and longitude of a target so that if you had a missile and you wanted to you know, bomb some building somewhere, you could just hone in on the building. And to implement the GPS, the United States set up this whole network of what are called as geostationary satellites around the world which are orbiting and sort of you can ping these satellites and using this triangulation you can get the exact point location of a particular person or a particular building or a particular ship or whatever it is and this was done you know in the 90s and 80s and 90s now in the year 2000 in fact on may 1st 2000 under president clinton the GPS was put in the commercial domain, which meant that anybody could build a GPS receiver and, and do this pinging of the system to check the location. Now today we know that the GPS ecosystem or the GPS economy is a very large economy. It runs into maybe hundreds and billions of dollars of market value. Your Google Maps uses GPS. Self-driving cars use GPS. Location-based services use GPS, Foursquare uses GPS, inertial navigating systems in planes use GPS. All that GPS fundamentally did was answer the question, where am I? But once it was put out for innovation in the public domain in 2000, within five, six years, you had all these apps that nobody had ever thought about. So today we have built this whole GPS economy, so to speak. So we visualize a very similar situation where around the Aadhaar platform in the next five to 10 years, Lots of applications will emerge which will be built by the government, by public sector agencies, by private agencies, by young innovators, and they will all require ID verification. And therefore, they'll come out with applications which we can't even visualize today. And that's the ecosystem that we hope will emerge in the next five to 10 years. And we believe that this is very important to our strategy because ultimately, if we're going to get a billion people on board, we need to create a virtuous cycle between people enrolling into the system and, and the use of the number. And therefore, we think that as more and more people have the number, more and more people who want to provide services will build applications that use that number. And as more and more, and more people build applications that use that number, then more and more people will get the number because they want access to the application. So the applications and the enrollment 
will create a virtuous cycle which will create the momentum for us to get everybody on board in the next few years. So this is a part of the original strategy of this whole thing. So let me just then talk about uh, what are the classes of applications we, we think of. Also. Now, again, I think we our imagination is not able to predict all the types of applications, but I'll give you three classes of applications which at least now look, look clear to us. The first is broadly what we can call as a KYC application. A KYC application is a know your customer application. Now what happens is that you, when you as a potential customer or a beneficiary or a consumer go for a particular service, the first thing they want to make sure is you are the person you claim to be. And they also want your name and address and, and photograph and all that. So building on this basic authentication, we have developed something called electronic KYC or electronic know your customer. And where the way it works is that at any service location point or any point of service, I want to get access to a public, a public service for which identity verification is a prerequisite. I'll go there, I'll give my name, I'll give my number, I'll, I'll authenticate myself using some authentication attribute. And then I authorize the UIDAI to release my KYC to that body which is doing the authentication. 